Simon here. Join the movement, the Discover Your Money Temperament movement. If you notice, I changed the masthead on the uh, the group because this is what we need to do. We need to get every we change the discussion on money, the dialogue on money, because money is too important to leave it to your unconscious brain. What I'm going to do for the next, uh, well, a good part of this afternoon is I'm going to go through the book chapter by chapter, give you my insights, and break it up into short palatable pieces so you don't have to sit here and look at me for that period of time. <clears throat> but a little background. How did I get into this? How did I write this book? Again, the book is uh, Money Makes Me Crazy. It was the, uh, the foundational book, which evolved into Discover Your Money, Temperament, A Common Sense Guide to Financial Security. Now, a little bit about this book, uh, just a little, little practical advice. This book was published to be held to be used as a notebook. There's plenty of space in the back for notes. I think the way you go through this book is page by page with a book, a highlighter, a pen and paper, maybe a notebook. Take notes as you go along. There are a lot of exercises in here. What I really want you to do is climb inside your head and figure out why you do what you do with money. This began a number of years ago. Uh, actually, when I was in the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant, one of the things I was tasked to do as a second lieutenant was to help my young Marines and sailors make better money choices. Now, if you've ever been in the military, I think you know exactly what I mean. It takes a young Marine with a little extra money to do some incredibly crazy things with money. Well, that involved into teaching some behavioral, uh, uh, teaching budgeting and personal finance. Uh, I did a little GED work when we were deployed. Uh, but during that time, I also picked up my first master's degree in management. I was actually going to get out of the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps wouldn't let me out. They said, no, you're doing such a wonderful job defending the country, I guess, that uh, uh, I had to take another set of orders. But after that, uh, my payback was teaching economics at the Naval Academy. And while I was at the Naval Academy, I worked with some of the brightest young men and women in the country. And I taught traditional economics, the way I was taught in college, that everybody is rational, everybody has complete information, that if I give you enough information, the little cost-benefit analysis you do in your head, you're going to come to the proper outcome. Well, how's that working out? I mean, we had midshipmen that were brilliant in the classroom, but doing incredibly stupid things with their money. I'll give you a case in point. When I was at the academy teaching, they had a program, what was called a career starter loan. Well, the career starter loan was to start your career, but most of the mids use it to buy a car. And we're not talking about any car. They were buying Corvettes and high-speed cars and, and European cars, spending a bunch of money. And what was really crazy about this spending pattern is most of the mids did not even have a place to park their vehicle. So unless you were first class, you had to find a place out in town, a girlfriend or something like that to leave your car. So it just didn't work. But worse than that, we found that we had young people, young lieutenants and ensigns that were losing their commissions because they were making stupid money decisions. See, in the military, if you get yourself in real bad financial problems, you can in fact be thrown out. But worse than that, <clears throat> we found that money problems were leading, leading to substance abuse, performance problems, loss of security clearances, domestic problems, and retention. Well, to make a long story short, I uh, left the Naval Academy. I uh, helped build the Marine Corps' financial management school program, worked for the uh, budget or, or the, um, the fiscal director of the Marine Corps, did some normal Marine Corps things, and I uh, picked up another master's degree in performance technology, which that simply means is I build systems that help people perform better. Um, came back from Desert Storm, did a tour with the Secretary of the Navy, and I was an aide to the Secretary of the Navy for financial management. And as you've been watching on TV, I was working with some of those people making some of those decisions. I was working with the House and the Senate Ar Armed Services Committee. I was working with the principals and their staff on money issues. And there I learned that politicians do not have a clue. That whole system is all run on emotion. And, and to say that whole process is, mash, uh, is rational with your money is absolutely not true. So uh, finally retired, retired as a lieutenant colonel and went into private practice as a financial advisor. And over the years as a financial advisor, I worked with hundreds of, of folks, mostly middle, middle class people, uh, just like most of you, and helped them build financial plans 
prepare for the future. But during that period of time, I was becoming very frustrated because I was finding that the industry itself, the financial services industry, seemed more focused on products and services, fees and commissions than you as the client. And at that period of time, I started work with my clients to start identifying and managing behavior to help them make behavioral choices with their money because it became obvious to me that number one, humans really are not hardwired to work well with money. See, our brains are, are designed to keep us alive and pass on our genes, not read the small print on, on, on uh, credit card receipts or do our taxes or any of those crazy things. Now, granted, there are people that do that, but not everybody, not everybody. The other problem I started running into is our concept of financial literacy in this, com in this country is terrible. It's abysmal. <clears throat> Excuse me. We really don't teach it. We don't teach financial literacy. For some reason, we seem to assume that when you reach 18 or 21 or whatever it is, you figure it out. And all you've got to do is go down and get a checking account and sign up for your first credit card or debit card and life is good. Well, how is that working out? And then the next piece is the fundamental rules of money have changed over the last few years. What worked a few years ago doesn't work today. And our economy is changing. Then you add one other variable that is a game changer for money. And that's called longevity. We are living longer. Because we're living longer, you need to be financially secure for a longer period of time. When I started as a financial advisor, a lot of the people I talked to were in their late 50s, early 60s. They had worked for the same company for years. They had pensions, I mean real pensions. They had social security. Their house was paid for or almost paid for. They had savings in the bank. They had a life insurance policy. Most of their family lived within walking distance. And at that time, we expected to keep them going for another five or 10 years. Well, how have things changed? Man, the definition of the family is different. The economy is different, but we're living longer. My mother-in-law lived to 103, but she had a financial plan and a financial perspective that was written in, I think, in 1913, and, and it was designed for somebody who was probably going to make it to her mid-50s, early 60s. Well, we had to do some scrambling. So this whole book all came together, and, and I said, I've got to do something different to give real people in the real world real opportunities to make good choices with their money based on how they naturally think and feel about money. Because in the industry, it was all about product and service, and we assumed you were rational. Think back to school. If you ever took a course in economics, it was the rational man concept that you can make good decisions because you have enough information. Well, how is that working out? So for the next few minutes, I'm going to take breaks in between. So, uh, you know, if you're not banging your head against the wall listening to me, you can, you can go someplace else. But I want to walk through this book. I want to give you why I think this is something you need to own. I think you need the hard copy version, something that you can put in your hands, something you can work with a highlighter, something you can take notes with, something you can write on your Bible or manual for financial security. And it's different. It's not like any other book out there. There are millions of books on financial planning and financial advice. They're good books, but they're technical books and they're about techniques. I'm talking about your behavior. If you understand your behavior first, then you can go find books and techniques and products that fit your temperament as opposed to the way we used to do it is try to change you to fit the tools and techniques. So the introduction is, hey, you're not very good with money. I guarantee it. And even if you think you're good with money, you're still emotional with money. Humans are not hardwired to work well with money. We are emotional beings who think we are not thinking beings with emotions. All you have to do is look around you. We've seen it in the last week and a half in the buying behavior. Go to a yard sale, look around your house. There are all kinds of examples of irrational spending. We do it all the time. And it's not a big deal if it's a one-off item because you stopped to get gas and you want to run into the convenience store 
and you buy, you know, a, a drink for five bucks or an expensive piece of coffee or a, a cup of coffee. But this becomes a real issue when you're going in to buy a car and you put an extra ten thousand dollars into that vehicle and stretch your payments from four years to seven years because it feels good because then you get into situations where your feeling brain is driving the situation it causes problems and that's what needs to be avoided so what i'm going to be talking about over the next 10 sessions yeah 10 sessions there are 10 chapters in the book and bear with me they're going to be short is i want to walk you through what I was thinking about when I wrote this book to help you have a roadmap, if you will, for better decisions with your money, to put you in a position that you can go, wow, stop, think, take a look around. What am I doing? Do I need to do this? And more importantly, if you've got a partner, wife, spouse, kids, I guarantee they have a different money temperament than you do. And you need to figure that out. And then finally, money is the common denominator of modern life. You have to understand how it works. So whether you're an employee, an employer in the gig economy, retired, it doesn't matter. You have to understand money, not only from a technical point of view, what it is and what it can't do, but how you relate to it, how you emotionally react with money, your spending panders, why you do what you do. And I think we're gonna understand once we go through this book, the key points and the high points and the things that I was trying to convey, you in fact will make better money decisions. You at least you'll know why you do some of the things you do. And hopefully if you're working with other folks, you can help them take better money choices. So stay tuned. I'm going to be doing these on and off for the next uh, hour or so until as I get through the book. <clears throat> this is basically the introduction. And the next session, I'm going to go over chapter one. And we're going to talk about why people just aren't really good with money. So either join me here back live or these will be posted and join the group. Get a copy of the book. Follow along. My goal is to help you make better money choices, but more importantly, together to launch a movement, discover your money temperament and change the world. Be back in a little minute.